it all starts with us going into the word, in seeking his face, and being willing to go in saying, yes, God, now what is it I got to do? And not wait in to find out what he wants you to do to decide if you're going to do it. But just going in saying, God, you know, I see this now. I'm walking that way. And it's been an amazing journey for me. And I hope it's been for you as well. And we have a few weeks left before we get to summer. It'll come up quicker than you can imagine. So I'm excited about this again night to get be together. Um, next week will be the week we have two, two teachings. So it'll be, there won't be table time. There will be two separate lessons with a break, so you'll have a chance to stand up and everything. And we're excited about that, too. It's going to be awesome. So let's pray and get started. Father, thank you so much for this evening. Thank you for Karen's uh, study and her preparing. And I pray that you would give her great wisdom and just fill every word she has to say and make it uh, and bring it to us from you. Okay, so people are fascinated with end of the world scenarios, right? I mean, all want to know what's going to happen at the end of time. You know, novels and movies and internet stuff. Uh, even scientists, teachers, geologists, all these people have their theories about how the world is going to end and why it's going to happen. Uh, some of the leading, leading theories you've probably heard out there before, and one of them is like the scorched earth theory where the sun is going to go supernova and it's going to uh, engulf, you know, Mercury and Venus and the earth and then we'll all be gone. Or, and then there's the AI apocalypse, which kind of seems more real now than it ever has before, but, <laughs> but that, you know, these intelligent machines are going to take over the world and, you know, put out, uh, kill everybody, and we've all seen that movie two, three, four times, right? <laughs> and a disease disaster, you've heard that theory too, that there's going to be a, a disease out there, they're natural or man-made, and it's just going to mutate too fast, it's going to uh, overwhelm the healthcare system, and everybody's going to die from that, and uh, that was the big fear a few years ago, right? That was what everybody was really upset about. And then you may have heard about super volcanoes, right? There's those big pools of magma that are down under the Earth's crust and it's, you know, he heating up and the pressure's getting so big that maybe one day it's just going to blow through the Earth's crust, fill the sky with ash, you, uh, blot out the sun, cause another ice age, and then the ash is going to settle down and kill all the plant life. You probably heard that one too. And, you know, that's they talk about Yellowstone being a super volcano, and those scientists say we're overdue for one. So there's a lot of reasons that, and these a lot of ideas out there that people think this is how the world is going to end. But apocalyptic scenarios are not just for the movies or scientists or people like that. There are plenty of Christians who are caught up in end time scenarios too. They like the, you know, know want to know what's going to happen. In fact, since 2020, I have heard more believing Christians say that they are certain that Jesus is coming back in our lifetime, and they have a lot of, you know, current event sort of things that they can point to to say this is why we think that that's going to happen. Uh, but the way believers tend to talk about all this stuff, it's almost like we're looking for a way to crack some combination that we can line up things and we can look for things in the scriptures that tell us and give us a hint about what is going to happen so we can have that kind of insider information. That's kind of the way that you hear people talk about it. But I don't really think that that should ever be our focus when we're talking about prophecy or anything like that, that that just figuring out so we'll have this information. It's not really the way we should focus on it. Well, fortunately for us, we don't have to be scared by all that kind of weird stuff we see in the media or on, online because Jesus has told us ahead of time what to expect. And now that doesn't mean we shouldn't be paying attention. As a matter of fact, as we go through today's chapter, you're going to see that's exactly what he says over and over and over again. There's going to be a lot of turmoil, a lot of natural disasters, all of that. But, and we have promises from Jesus that that stuff's kind of going to 
gear up, but it's not supposed to make us afraid, and it's not supposed to make us uh, freak out every time we hear something happen in the news. So, uh, as you might have guessed, or if you saw this week, we are in Mark chapter 13, where the disciples asked Jesus some questions about what is to come. So we're going to go through this whole chapter. There is a lot in this chapter, so we're going to kind of go through fast. But, uh, and we're going to cover the verses, and then we're going to get over to the end, and we'll talk about application, because we don't want to just read it and theorize. We want to know what Jesus wants us to do with that. So if you'll remember, if you haven't been here, you need to be caught up a little bit. We are in the last week of Jesus' life here on earth. And he has been in the temple now for a little while, and the Pharisees keep coming to him and asking him all of these questions, and he keeps answering their questions, but he, all, as he always does, he doesn't answer them the way they want him to. He raises the conversation, shifts the focus, and changes things around. And uh, so at the end of last week, we saw that he they finished uh, interrogating him, and then he switched and just leveled this denunciation against the scribes and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law for how that they were, were ignoring the clear teaching of the word of God and the law of God. And then we talked about at the end of last week about the woman with the two copper coins and how she was an example of the Pharisees uh, ignoring what the law said about taking care of these widows. And so... That is the bridge to the conversation in chapter 13. So he's finished his time in the temple, and he's about to exit. So we'll jump right into our verses. We go to verse 1. It says, as he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. So he's commenting on what the temple looks like walking out. I don't know if he was just uncomfortable about, uncomfortable about that whole thing with the scribes and Pharisees and trying to change the subject or whatever, but he just makes this offhand comment about how amazing the temple was. Now, we've talked about it before, but the structure of the temple was enormous. It was huge. It covered some 36 acres of the courtyard and the structure itself. Obviously, the center of all Jerusalem and he, so they comment on massive stones. And so I read online and I did some studying that one block, one stone, 18 feet wide. 18 feet. Now, in your normal room in a house, 10 by 10, this is huge. But double the size of that one single stone. And 40 foot columns carved out of a single stone. So it was amazing. So they're commenting on what a glorious work of architecture this is. And so, like Jesus always does, he doesn't just go, yeah, that's cool. <laughs> he changes the subject, changes the focus of what they're saying, even with his disciples. And so he looks at them and says, you see all these great buildings? Not one stone here will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. Now, this was a shocking statement to the disciples. The temple actually wasn't even complete at this point. It won't be finished uh, and, and be done completely till 64 AD, only six years before the temple is going to be destroyed by the Romans in 70 AD by the Emperor Titus, who comes in and just lays waste to Jerusalem, sets the building, uh, sets the, the, the temple on fire, and it fulfills Jesus' prophecy, what he says right here. So the question is, wait, 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 wait. Didn't you say it was made of stone? How does setting it on fire make it, it collapse? Because, I mean, we could go out here and set Stone Mountain on fire, right? All the trees would be burned up, and Stone Mountain would still be there, right? So, it, that's normally, rocks, uh, rocks don't burn, but this, the temple is made of limestone. And limestone is a porous rock, and so there's water that would be absorbed by the rocks. So, when Titus and the Romans came in and set it on fire, there's lots of stuff that burns in the temple, lots of wood, lots of uh, uh, cloth things, and so when the the fire is set, it heats up these porous rocks, the water inside it evaporates, expands, and blows these limestone uh, blocks apart like popcorn. And so it's just left rubble of the, the temple fulfilling this prophecy that not one stone was left on top of the other after this uh, event. So obviously such a statement that, that Jesus said causes a, 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 in the minds of the disciples 
Caused him to ask some more questions. So they exit the temple, they head back out to the Mount of Olives. And um, so, so if you remember our map from a few weeks ago, here's, the, here's Jerusalem. And uh, um, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus' house is back in Bethany. So they exit out of the East Gate. You remember that when we talked about that? They've exited out and they stop at the Mount of Olives. And so they're kind of sitting up on the hill overlooking Jerusalem and the temple. So it says there that when they had a quiet moment, that Peter, James, John, and Andrew come up to him and he's like, okay, can you tell us when this stuff's going to happen? Can you tell us what's going to happen? And what's the sign that this, the temple is going to be destroyed? And so uh, Jesus answers this question that they have and launches in to a whole discussion about future things that uh, he sets for them a picture of both when the destruction will take place in the near future, that is in their lifetime, and the far future when he will return with glory and power. So at this time, for the disciples and for the other people, they didn't have a concept of two comings of, of, of the Messiah. They saw it as one event. So when they read the Old Testament, they saw the humble servant Messiah and the, uh, the coming with glory and power Messiah as the same event. It was kind of like if you're standing out on uh, up in the mountains and you're looking out over a mountain range and you can see in the distance a lot of the mountain peaks. From where you stand, looks like they're all close together. But if you got closer to it, you can see that some of those peaks might be miles and miles apart, right? You don't, can't see the valley in between. So, so the people during this time couldn't see that there was the valley of the church age between the first and the second coming of Christ. They never saw that there was two uh, events there. So he goes on to tell them, and he talks about in verse 5, he says, watch out. This is the first thing he says about future events. That's watch out that no one deceives you. This is kind of the, 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 the uh, heading or the topic, topic sentence for everything else he's going to say. He's saying, watch out that no one deceives you. Deceives you. Many will come in my name claiming I am he and will deceive many. So this is the first of six times Jesus says in this one chapter, watch out or pay attention. So that's the whole point of everything he's going to say here. It's the whole discourse is a warning. Don't be deceived. Pay attention so you don't miss and, and misunderstand what's really happening all around you. And so then he goes on and gives a list of kind of things we need to be paying attention to in wars and rumors of wars. And, uh, and he says, such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom, and there will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of earth pain. So and there's a lot of ton, and tons of books and internet sites and all this kind of stuff that kind of analyze the frequency of international conflicts, natural disasters, like it says in verse 7 there. And, and, they're, and they look at it to say, hey, you know what? The frequency of, the, of these things is getting closer and closer together the further along you move in history. And some of them have suggested that the frequency of these events is increasing because we're nearing the end times. But what does it really say here? Look at verse 7 in the end. All this stuff's going to happen, but the end is still to come. Still to come. It's not saying the end is here. The end is still to come. That is, when you see all this stuff, pay attention. But the end times are not here yet. It's just a herald of what is about to happen. Happen. But it does say, in the verse 8, this is the beginning of birth pangs. And anybody in here who has kids knows exactly what that means. Say, and if you carry that analogy out, when labor starts, it means something's happening, right? Something's going to happen. But calculating exactly when it's going to happen is a whole other thing, right? So when I have four kids, each one of my labors were completely different. We went 24, 12, 6, and 3. So we sped up and cut it in half every time. My sister-in-law, 48 hours for her first kid. <laughs> you know, and my daughter, who just had my first grandbaby in 22, he came in six hours, very unusual for a first baby, to come from very first flutters to he's here. 
we almost missed it because we're like, she's telling us I'm going to the hospital. And I'm like, yeah, we don't need to come yet. And then she calls me and she's like, okay, mom, it's now. I'm like, now. <laughs> so anyway, uh, you can't tell. So, so, you know, and before the advent of drugs that help kind of move that labor along, it could be a long time sometimes. So the, so the, the labor can be a varying length. So it can speed up. It can slow down. The onset of labor doesn't tell you when the baby's coming, only that once it starts, you can't stop it, right? That's what he's telling us here. So if we start noticing more frequent natural disasters, more conflict in the wor world, what do we do? Not worry, not panic, not go out and buy 76 cans of uh, tuna like one of my friends did during Y2K and her family doesn't even like tuna. So, <laughs> I mean, we don't need to panic and do weird stuff. What do we do? He, Jesus tells us, verse 9, be on your guard. Again, pay attention. Then he tells us what might happen. You will be handed over to the local councils, flogged in synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And, the, and so what he tells us here is that we have to pay attention and notice also with the frequency of that other stuff, the, the, the incidence of persecution is also going to be on the rise. He says, don't be surprised by this. Now, notice that, that one of the good parts of the persecution he tells us is, or the positive things, I don't know if it's a good is the right word, but positive is that you're going to be stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. So this persecution is going to give opportunity to witness to some very influential people along the way. So when governments and cultures start turning against Christians, he says, don't be surprised that by that you're warned that's a word to us today right we just kind of get really upset and nervous because we see hostilities rising against the church and we act like it's a surprise but he says right here don't be surprised that what he just went exactly what jesus said was going to happen instead of freaking out being all upset and trying to get throw ourselves back to the 1950s our answer to ourselves and to other people should be you know what? Jesus told us that this was going to happen. This is a fulfillment of prophecy. It is a signpost of his coming return. And so, hallelujah, prophecy is being fulfilled among us right now with persecution being on the rise. Now, that's not what we like. We like to see fulfillment of prophecy being the dead rise and everybody being healed, you know, great revival, that kind of thing. We love that. But this is just as much part of prophecy as the things we like to hear about, isn't it? So we can rejoice, not that we are being persecuted, nobody wants that, but we can rejoice that prophecy is unfolding right in front of us. And so persecution of Christians equals fulfillment of scripture. Not that we love that, again, it's exactly what it means. And then here at the end, verse 10, he says, the gospel must first be preached to all nations. That's about as close as we get to a when verse as there is. Gospel preached to all nations. And it's debatable as to whether that's already happened or not. Some people say yes with the advent of technology, the internet. It's, they say the gospel's blanketed the globe. But other people will say there's a lot of remote people groups out there who still need to hear the gospel. Just think about North Korea, right? Completely closed country. They don't have the internet. They barely have light there. I mean, uh, electric lights there. And so they don't have the gospel yet. So it seems, seems to me we still have work to do. But it's much closer than it has been even a few generations ago. And so he goes on. Whenever you're arrested, brought to trial, don't worry beforehand what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it's not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. And he goes on to say, brother, uh, brothers are going to betray each other, fathers and children, children against their parents. And then he says, all men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So if we look at that first part of verse 13, all men will hate you. Uh, now, uh, we can see that again happening in our country right now. It used to be a haven for the gospel. But you can see how social media and the media in itself, platforms are openly hostile to the gospel. But the encouragement here is what? 
You're not alone. God is with you. And if we commit ourselves to trust God, to stand up for his truth, that verse 11, God will speak through us. We don't have to worry about what if, what if, what if, that at the time when we need it, the Holy Spirit will give us the words to say. So don't worry about later. Be faithful right now, and you'll be prepared to handle whatever comes. And Jesus goes on. This is a complicated part of scripture right here. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, let the reader understand. That's Mark's commentary there. He's put an emphasis on this. He said, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter into the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful will it be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Now, this uh, is complicated, like I said, uh, and it's a possible to do a whole series of message on this and where this comes from and what it is, but we don't have time for that. I'm just going to touch on it briefly. This reference to the abomination that causes desolation comes from Daniel chapter 11. In main service, we're going to get to that, so I'm sure that uh, whoever teaches that portion will cover it. But the whole chapter really gives us an overview of the flow of history from Daniel's time all the way up to, to the end of the world. Now, of course, not all events are included in that, but uh, what he refers to is pretty, uh, pretty detailed and devastatingly accurate. And so, so much so that the critics of the book of Daniel, this is one of the things that they point to. They say he couldn't have written it about it before because it's too Perfect. It, 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 it tells us about the flow of history too accurately. It must have been written after the things happened and then put into the book of Daniel, which, of course, is uh, lunacy. Um, we, we got a God who knows all of history, so he gave it to him at the time. That's why it's accurate, not because he cheated. <laughs> so uh, God gave him that. But by the end of the book of Daniel, the end of the chapter 11, he writes, speaking of a future leader. And he says in verse 31, his armed forces will rise up to desecrate the temple fortress and will abolish the daily sacrifice. Then they will set up the abomination that causes desolation. That's where that comes from, what Jesus is talking about. Now, an abomination, just, just basic word study here, abomination means disgust or hatred. But in the context of scripture, it means a gross sin. Desolation is something that is complete emptiness or utter destruction. So essentially he's saying this is a gross, appalling sin that leads to destruction. That's what that abomination that causes desolation means and what Jesus is uh, referring to. And now what it here is talking about is that pagan idolatry has been set up in the temple. And this specific prophecy by Daniel is fulfilled in 186 B.C., okay? So the king, at the time, the king of Syria was ruling over Jerusalem, ruling over Palestine, and he was really a harsh and violent guy. And it was so bad for the Jews during that time that they rose up and rebelled against this king. And in response, he came in and took over and stopped the sacrifices in the temple, just like it says here in Daniel. And he went on to do that, and this is the abomination, is that he set up an idol to Zeus inside the temple and then began sacrificing pigs on the altar there. Now, if you know anything about, about uh, Jewish law, that pigs were unclean, and to have that in the temple was an abomination to them. So they started a war over this. So that's, that's what... The history and the fulfillment of what Daniel is saying here, and that's the background and what Jesus is referring back to when he talks to his disciples. He's saying, be on the alert in future times for something similar to happen. First, uh, Second Thessalonians tells us a little bit more about the guy who's going to be uh, at end times. We talk about him as being the Antichrist. He said that the man of lawlessness is what Thessalonians, what Paul says. Doomed to destruction, here's what he'll do. He'll oppose, exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself up in God's temple, proclaiming himself to be God. So that future ruler there will come in on the scene, proclaim himself to be God, potentially de desecrating the temple again with himself. Now, we can't be dogmatic about all that kind of stuff, but that's generally... 
uh, the, the idea there, so Jesus is saying that there's going to be a lot of turmoil, a lot of confusion, a lot of destruction, the like of which the world has never seen up until that point. So, and he goes on, and he says in this passage here, he says there's going to be an unrestrained assault on anyone who is faithful to Christ. That's going to be the extension of that. So we need to know the truth, and we need to stick to it. More warnings from Jesus. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Christ, or there he is, don't believe it. For false Christ, false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, even if it were possible. So here he's reminding us that all miracles don't come from God. Okay? We're going to see a lot of miraculous things. And it, 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 the enemy is able to do miraculous things. Even Jesus says to a group of people, he says, he said, they come up to him, and he said, you know, he said, we cast out demons in your name. We did miracles in your names. And he looks at him and goes, I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. And so all things that look miraculous, all things that look like God are not God. Jesus told us that, and we, we know that by their fruits, you will know them. That doesn't just mean by their actions. The real evidence of fruit of someone's life is what? The fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, that is faithfulness to God, faithfulness to the Scripture, faithfulness to Christ, and self-control. So, why does Jesus tell us all this? Not to argue about this version of the end times or that version of the end times. To think we have that spiritual combination that nobody else has. Once again, he tells us why he's telling us this. Be on your guard. Pay attention to what's going on. I have told you everything ahead of time. So he, we don't, he doesn't want us wandering through life and specifically about this scripture to see something on the news or some amazing thing happen. Somebody out there doing a miracle and say, God is doing this. And we go, oh, maybe that is God. Mm -hmm. No, he's saying, don't be surprised. Don't be deceived. Stick to what you know. And what you've been told ahead. Getting down toward the end. But in those days following that distress, the sun will be darkened. Moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky. And the heavenly bodies will be shaken. And this is a quote from Isaiah 13 and 34. And he's pointing toward now cosmic events that were going to take place. And, you know, whenever I read stuff like this, I always wonder... What, is, what are the news media outlets going to do when this stuff starts happening? How are they going to explain what's going on? I know they're going to come up with something, but it, I'm sure it's going to be a fantastic story. I mean, if you read anything in Revelation, you know that things get pretty bad before they start getting better. But Jesus says here they also get better, in fact, a whole lot better. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and, and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of the heavens. So, I mean, that's going to be the day, right? That's what we're looking for. That will be really exciting. Also, how will they explain that? But I don't know. <laughs> and he goes on in verse uh, 28 and says, Listen to the lesson from the fig tree. We've seen fig trees before coming up in this week. And he's also, remember, sitting on the Mount of Olives, and there are fig trees all around him. He says, as soon as the twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it's near right at the door. And so he's saying, you know, you're good at telling when the seasons change. Look outside, see things budding, and just like it is here in Atlanta, the flowers are out and the trees are starting to bud. Pollen is here. <laughs> and we know that it's not going to be long until it's full on spring and then summer's right behind it. He's saying you can look around and see those signs of nature and tell what's happening. He's saying look around you with spiritual eyes and see what's going on around us that points us to God's timetable. He's saying it's just as obvious as that if you're using your spiritual discernment, listening to what the Spirit has to say. Then he says, I tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things has happened. Now, this generation has a couple of interpretations. 
One is that this generation, this means this age, that is everything from the time of the ascension of Christ until to his return. That, that is one age, the church age. So that these things are going to continue until the next big event in God's timetable, which is the return of Christ. So it could be that, or some people say that the other interpretation is that once these events start, that they'll unfold pretty quickly. That is in one normal generation. That at, once it starts happening, it's going to be quick when it happens. So it could be either, or both. So uh, verse 31 Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And now this is a wonderful encouragement for us after a lot of hard stuff to get through. He says that everything around us is going to be shaken, but he never is. His word is never shaken. And he says his word, what he says, and the word of God is more enduring than the creation. Because we think, oh, there's nothing more reliable than the coming up of the sun and going down of the sun and the changing of the seasons, they're very predictable. Now he's saying, all of that's going to shake. All of that's going to be in turmoil. But my word never is shaken. And so Jesus uh, then answers the question everybody wants to know, and that is when? Nobody knows the day or the hour, not even the angels in heaven or the sun, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do know. You do not know when that time will come. So he doesn't tell us the when question that we all want to know. But he's more emphatic than just saying, saying that. He says, you do not know. And if you think you do, you're wrong. <laughs> he says, all the energy, all the questions, all of that angst around that question, when it's going to happen, is futile. It is futile. You can't know because Jesus says that. Okay? Not, and, but what not knowing does for us is keeps us dependent on him and focused on the task at hand and what he gives us to do. And remember, if we needed to know, he would help us. So we don't need to know. So don't be distracted by reading all this stuff and listening to all this stuff. They're trying to tell you an answer that you can't have. Okay, it is a waste of time. So we're up to the end of this chapter, but before we read these last couple of verses, I want to talk about application, and we'll come back and get the last couple of verses at the end. So, so God's not about just to give it satisfying our curiosity. There's always a purpose purpose for what He's telling it. He's here. So, four takeaways from this chapter, real quickly. First is difficult times are coming. Don't let that consume you. Jesus told us that they are coming. It's, so it's very easy to look around us and be worried and anxious and discouraged. The economy, the politics, the earthquakes, tornadoes, hurricanes, all that stuff. You can't forget what happened four years ago, right? I mean, that's just crazy stuff happening. There's always something that's going to make us feel anxious. We don't have to look very far, right? Just turn on the TV or log on, and you'll find something that's going to make you anxious. What does God say about our anxieties? A couple of verses. Cast how many of your anxieties? All. All your anxieties on him, for he cares for you. Then Philippians 4, 6. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer, petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the result of that is... The peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So, what do prayer and petition do for us? They change our focus, right? Instead of us looking at stuff right here in front of us, we start looking at God, and then we, we put everything that's going on in the world against the backdrop of who He is. That changes how we look at it, or it should. Prayer puts our focus off of me and what am I going to do and what happens if this happens and what if, what if, what if. It changes it from that off of me and on to him. And when we do that, uh, even if crazy things happen, God will sustain us through it. That is his promise to us. And then he promises on top of that that we will have his peace. Not might have. He says, it will guard your hearts and minds 
in Christ Jesus. So it's it's a sure thing. So our focus needs to be what on God is or what Jesus is doing through us, not what is going on around us. That's the big difference. Don't be fearful. He says you've been warned. Don't focus so much on, on the bad things that are happening out there. They're always going to be here to the point where it stops you from doing good. That's what he says here. Uh, and um, so the first thing is, is that we don't, difficulty is coming. Then he says expect opposition. He says that several times through this whole chapter here. And um, he even tells us that people are going to hate us. So why don't people like Christians? I mean, we, yeah, I mean, we're trying to be kind and gentle and merciful and serve. Why don't they like us? Well, John 15 tells us you belong to the world. It will love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. Clear answer? That's why the world hates you. Remember the words I spoke to you? No servant is greater than his master. If they persecute me, they'll persecute you. If they obey my teaching, they'll obey yours also. They will treat you this way. Here's the reason. Because of my name, for they do not know the one who sent me. So we should expect opposition to the gospel and be ready to proclaim the truth no matter what. And the truth is if we don't feel opposition, it could be we're not bright enough to threaten the darkness. The world might think, you know what? She belongs to us. And we don't want that. We want to be different enough that the world goes, yep, they're standing for something different. And, you know, so we need to ask God about those things. And, uh, but what we learn here is that when things grow darker in the world, the light becomes brighter, right? It's easier to see. And we have to choose to which side we're going to be on. I used to tell my kids when I was homeschooling, I always said, when I grew up, in my age, you didn't have to choose sides. You didn't have to pick which side you want to be on. Because the, the world really kind of was okay with the church. They respected the Bible. They respected God. I said, so I didn't have to choose. You could kind of walk the middle. You could kind of be liked by the world and kind of be liked by the church too. But that's not the truth anymore. And especially I told him, I told him, when you grow up, I said, if, if, if you have to choose, you have to choose early. But the truth is all of us have to choose now. We don't, we're not able to walk that kind of middle of the road anymore. You got to choose light or dark. And so then the third thing is, is that there's an end coming to all this crazy madness in the world, and the end is Jesus. And so the world is not forever going to be given over to sin and the devil. You might look around and think, you know, and a lot of times we hear things that go on and go, you know what? What is going on? Why is God allowing all this crazy stuff to happen? It is that people are buried by a huge earthquake, or there's vicious self-serving dictators, or, or killing children out there. Why is all there sickness and suffering and sorrow and all of these bad things happening? Is God in those things? Oftentimes it's people who are causing those things, not God. And, uh, and there's a lot of effects of bad things that happen in the world. Uh, because of sin in the world itself. It has eroded everything, even the, the creation around us right down to our bodies, right? So it's so easy to look at stuff out there and say, God, why don't you do something? Just fix all of this. And we want him to come back. I mean, you've probably prayed, amen, come Lord Jesus, haven't you? Yeah. I have. <laughs> it's like, come on now. But the truth is, there's a reason that he doesn't come. Second Peter tells us that. He's not slow in keeping his promises. That is his promise to return. As somebody understands slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to be perish, but everyone to come to repentance. So here's the reason that God waits to bring his justice. Once Jesus comes back, those who are unrepentant, it's all over. There's not any more opportunities. It's too late. So God waits and withholds his wrath and, 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 and withholds the, the, the settling of his kingdom and fixing everything on this earth. I mean, believers have been praying for Jesus to come back for centuries, but aren't you glad he didn't bring his justice to this world before you were saved? I am. I'm really glad. I mean, if you were saved in the last few years or even the last few decades, you know what? 
God was waiting to bring about his justice, waiting to culminate his ultimate end to all things, his final end of restor restoration to everything. He was waiting for you. And he was waiting for me. You see, we're that important to him. And I think oftentimes we forget that. See, the news assaults us all the time, the internet, all the time with every detail of these awful crimes that are happening everywhere. We become desensitized to it so that it doesn't even matter when we see that, that you know, in, think internationally where hundreds of, of people are killed, we're just like, oh, it doesn't bother us. Or, you know, some people like to look at things online about people getting hurt or killed online and they just go, yeah. It doesn't make any difference to us, but that is not the way God looks at it. I mean, it matters to God. Every single soul matters to him. We are all made in his image and are very immensely valuable to him. He does not want a single one of us to perish. And that includes even the most hated enemy who would plot against you on purpose. He loves that person, too. So he withholds his judgment, sometimes to the point where we get impatient with him, right? Thinking, well, you've forgotten about us. Aren't you paying attention to what's going on here, God? But he has a purpose in his delay. And his purpose is mercy. And he's waiting, patiently waiting for people to come to him. So verse, 20, but verse 10 of this same passage here tells us that that day is going to be over. The day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. So judgment is coming one day. It's a guarantee and we need to live in light of this real truth and believe that that's going to happen and be about his business right now. What Jesus said in Mark 13, don't be distracted. Pay attention to what's going on around you. Then the last point here is focus on your job, not your situation. Okay? This is going to take us back to Mark 13 to wrap up this chapter. Go back to these verses. He says, Jesus gives us a little story here, a little mini parable. He says, it's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening, or at midnight, or when the rooster crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. And so he says in this little section, three times, watch, pay attention. It's not hard to understand what he's saying here. Don't get distracted. Do your assigned task. See, you are the servant with the assigned task in this story. He says, be about whatever God has given you to do. You don't have as much time as you think you do. So if you have kids, raise those kids who will live for Jesus. If it's work in a place where there's no godly influence, then shine your light there. If it's to be in a classroom, train those kids. Influence them for Jesus in any way you can. If it's uh, to help people, serve joyfully. And if you have some boring uh, job, you say, if this is not even important, I don't know even what I'm doing, then do it to the best of your ability and interact with the people that come into your contact for Jesus in a way that reflects him and in your homes. That's where we can sometimes shine the brightest. So you are here to live for yourself. You have an assignment from Jesus, find out what it is, and then get busy doing it. So I want to wrap up uh, um, this whole section here by going back to 2 Peter 3 there, with the, we talked about the day of the Lord, and um, I, you know, we can count on that, that's coming, but in the next verse, what it says is the most important point that we need to keep in mind anytime we talk about prophecy or uh, things to come. This needs to be in the forefront of our thinking. If we're not thinking this way, we're looking for that combination, like I said at the beginning, 
then our focus is off. We're not just looking for a crystal ball out there to tell us what's going to happen to satisfy our curiosity. That's not our focus. The point of all discussions about end times and prophecy needs to have this focus. I cannot stress it enough, and it's right here in 2 Peter. Since everything will be destroyed in the day of the Lord, what kind of people ought you be? And then Peter answers it for us. You ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. So God doesn't give us warnings in Mark 13 or Revelation or Daniel or Thessalonians or anywhere else to give us that insider information. He gives it to us so we will be changed. That we will be serious about godliness, serious about holiness, serious about dealing with sin, and living for Jesus and making our lives count. That's the whole reason that we need to be learning. He warns us with all these prophetic things saying it's coming. Live differently because of it. So what you do for Jesus matters. In fact, everything that you do matters. It's just where it matters. For Jesus? Or not. So much that we need, we, we focus so much on things and so much attention in this world, we get distracted and we focus on things that burn. They will be gone. They are going to burn up. Jesus says, put your attention where it matters. Lay up your treasures in heaven where they won't be destroyed. You remember, you're that servant in Jesus' story at the end of the chapter. Master went away. He's coming back. I'm not going to tell you when it is. But he gave you something to do. Get busy. Get busy. Your assignment is important. You need to focus. You don't know when he's coming back, whether it be individually for you in death or corporately for all of us in his second return. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, don't let the master return and find you sleeping. So um, he said, don't get distracted. Pay attention. Don't get all, all sidetracked by stuff that doesn't matter for eternity. That's the whole point of Mark 13, the entire thing. So if you don't know what your job is, don't know what your role is, just start taking the word of God, open it up, and taking it at face value. Commit to it. Commit to what you read. You don't have to go to some weird hard passage. Just start with stuff that's, that's easy to understand. I mean, stuff like forgiving people that hurts you. Focusing on God first, seeking his kingdom, serving other people, giving yourself away to other people, being kind, compassionate, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, just as God in Christ Jesus forgave you. Just start right there. That's enough to keep busy for a while. <laughs> but if your heart is bent toward God, then you can be sure that he will make it clear what the next steps are for you. Wrap up with Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding. As we acknowledge him in all our ways, he will make your paths straight. Focus on God. Do what he's called you to do. What, always he's, what he's already said in his word. And trust him through the power of the Holy Spirit and to the glory of God to show you what to do next. Amen? Amen. God, we just thank you that you uh, remind us that we don't need to look for hidden information, but that you make it very plain and clear what you want us to do. And that is you want us to be conformed to your image in every single thing we do, whether we deal with family or friends or strangers, whether we serve in the church or in our uh, homes or in our workplace. God, help us be changed and live in a life of future things that they're going to happen and we can trust that your word is true and we will not be found wanting if we will put our faith and our hope in you and we pray in your holy name amen